Okay, so what's the God deed side? With God deeds, the whole thought pattern is about God's approval, not people. It's not against people. They're just not involved in the decision making directly. The direct person is God alone. Hi, God, should I eat cereal for breakfast? You're really not concerned about the cereal? You're not concerned about doing a good deed? What you're concerned about is just knowing God's answer to the question because you just want to know. You're interested to know what God thinks about what you should eat for breakfast. You know he's got an opinion on it. He's got an opinion on everything. Wouldn't it be more fun to eat breakfast knowing that it was God's opinion versus just eating to feed your belly? Now, of course, if you have your own opinion about what to eat for breakfast and you're actually going to stick it out and find out God's and His opinion doesn't agree with yours, then then there's going to be a little tension there. And, and, and most of the time, at least when I ask a question like I did a little bit ago, I came up with an answer right away, and I'm still not sure it's God's. But, it, but the, the question always, when I ask him like this, it's always like, what's good about it, what's bad about it? That's always the answer I get. Well, sometimes I get an answer immediately. And, and sometimes he just insists. But generally speaking, it's what's good about it, what's bad about it. And there's a sort of silence, and then I'm supposed to reason out to him why why choose this food over that food and it's never about the food it's not about even obedience I mean it's phrased that way it's about intrinsics and it gets to the heart of what God designed and why he designed it why does he pick A versus B because I don't know about you, but I'm, you know, I've been there, done that. I've, I've, I've seen it all. I have no more faith in people whatsoever. And I have no faith in myself since forever. So, you know, what am I going to do with my life? I don't care if I had a lot of money or no money. All I want to know is God and everything else is boring by comparison. So I want everything to be ennobled somehow. If I go to the store and I buy orange juice... I, I need that to be a better occasion than that because, you know, orange juice is a mundane thing and buying at the store is a mundane thing and everything is pouring. How, how do I get more value out of the moments I have to spend than just cleaning and cooking and eating and working and blah, 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 blah. Okay? I want more out of life. Well, the most I can get out of life is to know what God thinks. That's the happiest thing there is. Okay, so God, what do I eat for breakfast? Should be bran flakes. Okay, well, bran flakes, if I eat them, will do this. If I eat an egg, that will do that. da 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 And in the process of reasoning that out, which, you know, can take a long time or no time, I'll, I'll, I'll start to know the answer. And then what I really get to know is why God wanted that answer. What was his thought pattern behind it? So now it's not just breakfast anymore. It's something better than breakfast. So while for so associated and in that moment forever before God in front of his face will be the association of that breakfast question with the answer and his answers are always really witty, okay? Very ironic, witty. He's got a really keen sense of humor. And I will remember it too. And it elucidates something about him. And it was a moment of fellowship with him. That's what the Old Testament sacrifices all were. They weren't sacrifices of that the people made. The animals were killing, being killed. The people weren't being killed. People had to go to the hassle to bring the animal in. And there were certain economic laws you could argue. But God had to provide the blemishless animal. Only God can make an animal have no blemish. Okay. So, the whole idea of sacrifices 
First of all, because nobody ate meat in the ancient world, so to have so many meat sacrifices meant that God had to provide a whole lot of meat to Israel. So when you went through the nation of Israel, all you smelled was meat, which is a true luxury in the ancient world. Okay, constant meat cooking. Okay, what did you do with the sacrifice in the Old Testament? Yeah, I went and brought the animal. The priest slit the throat of the animal. It bled to death, but it couldn't feel anything because he slit the carotid artery. So the animal really doesn't know what's happening to it. And then the animal got cooked. Part of the animal was given to the priest, and part you ate. Now, not every sacrifice in the Levitical sacrifice system was like that. But most of them were. You got part to eat there. And the priest got part. So what is that? Dinner. Breakfast. Lunch. You sinned. And what do you get in return for that? Lunch with God. Dinner with God. You're eating part of the sacrifice to show that you know, you're with God there. See, you, the priest, at the sanctuary, you know, the local sanctuary, or the one in Jerusalem. You're eating with God. You're dining with God. You sin, you get dinner. And you're getting meat. Which most people in the ancient world didn't get to have. God demanded a sacrifice of meat for sin. Not always, it depended on your economic status, but generally speaking. And it had to be a blemishless animal, best of the herd. And you got to eat it. Well, most people in the ancient world wouldn't get to see a, a meat dinner except, you know, once every four months. I mean, you're sinning every day. So you're eating meat every day. Because God has to give you the... God knows when you're going to sin. So he's got to give you the means to get the animal. You either buy it or you're growing it. So you eat meat. You eat dinner. You sin and you get dinner as return. See the association? So, God, what do I eat for breakfast? Now notice what's not happening there. There's no question about performance. There's no question about getting approved by God. The entire scope of the question is about knowing what God likes and doesn't like and, you know, playing with it. I don't want it to just be about breakfast. I want it to be about God because I want everything to be about God because everything else is boring. Okay, so now breakfast isn't breakfast anymore, but was an occasion to learn God better. Has nothing to do with my self-worth. You can argue it has to do with his self-worth, but I, that I already know. I want to just have the time with him. I just want to hear him talk. I want to know him better. So, it's not really about performance at God's end either. It's just, hi God, what do you think? Whatever you think, I want to play with that. Of course, if he thinks differently than I, then, you know, there's a relationship problem. And I usually have to use one John 1 John 1.9 because I'm always wrong and he is always right. But it's still about the relationship. Now, in a sense, it's a little bit addicting. Because it's enjoyable to know God. So if I have an enjoyment of knowing God in moment one, moment two I'm going to want it again. So it's a little easier to ask God. So this habit of asking God about breakfast and what do I wear and what do I write in an email, it becomes a habit because I want it each time. But unlike the good deeder who has to do more and more and more to get less and less enjoyment, I get more enjoyment than I got the first time. Because I know God better the second time, the third time, the fifth time, the hundredth time. So I've got all that past enjoyment of learning Him in my head, which of course only the Holy Spirit runs and brings to my mind, so that I enjoy God today. 
a thousand times better, more, than I did 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, sometimes even yesterday. It's, it's accretive. The enjoyment is accretive. Instead of it being dulling, with an addiction, you have to have a bigger hit to get something less than the first high that you got. All addictions are like that. You have to have a bigger and bigger dose to get a lower and lower satisfaction until eventually you can have a killing dose and there's almost no satisfaction. That's how addiction works. In the beginning, if you get hooked on heroin, marijuana, or whatever, th those first few times, it doesn't take much to give you the high. Same thing with alcohol. Same thing with good deeds. Same thing with killing. The high that people get from murder, there's a high that comes from it. It's really high the first time. It's less the second, the third, the fifth, the sixth. And eventually you need to kill, but when you kill, when you murder, you get no pleasure out of it. And you still keep needing to do it. There's a neat movie called uh, Mr. Brooks that Kevin Costner stars in that sort of depicts that. It's a very interesting movie. I just saw it for the first time a couple days ago. With God, it's the opposite. Less and less of moments of insight about him give you bigger and bigger pleasure, satisfaction, building your soul. It's just the opposite of the regular addiction. So I can't even imagine how happy heaven is. It must be, it, it's just off the charts. Because every moment that I have with him now is so much more exciting than it was. And it always starts out like a kind of slog. Okay, God, I'm eating breakfast. What should I eat now? You know, when I first started this habit thing that I'm telling you about, where you ask God all the time. First of all, I still forget it all too often. But in the beginning, I hardly remembered it at all. And it started on a different topic. It started on using one John one nine. I used to only remember to use one John one nine just before Bible class, which was every day. And then I started to get in the habit of using it before Bible class. But I wouldn't remember to use it. And then I think, I, I forget when that was, but I asked him, you know, to remind me to use it. And he started doing that. And then it became a habit so much that it's even a habit in my sleep to use it now. Okay. So... At first, when you're trying to do this thing I'm talking about, asking God questions, it's going to seem like a hassle. But if you keep on repeating it, it will actually become enjoyable because that's how the human body is anyhow. Once you start doing something, the body cannot discern between good and bad. Once you start doing something, when you repeat it, the body starts to like the repetition. It likes familiarity. And it can't tell the difference between familiarity with something that's bad and familiarity with something that's good. Like if you eat, if you eat, um, you take drugs, drugs are addicting of their own, but it's not simply the drug itself, it's the habit of taking it. When you start to get into a habit of doing anything, good or bad, your body starts to crave that habit being repeated because you repeated it. Well, it works the same thing with recalling Bible, thinking toward God. The body sort of is a built-in helper mechanism that way. If you keep repeating the question, God, what should I be thinking, what should I be doing? You're going to get in the habit of asking, and he's going to be answering you. But for a long time and often, you won't necessarily know the answer. Okay? But keep asking anyway. And eventually your body will be trained to ask, to remind you to ask the question. The Holy Spirit's going to remind you to ask the question. And you will start to enjoy it a lot. It's the highest, it's the most enjoyable thing in life. Learning about God and hearing His answers is just... Why do you think I harp so much on the Greek and Hebrew? Why do you think I do those videos? I'm not doing them to do a good deed. I'm not getting any brownie points from God for doing it. 
It is my job to disclose the Hebrew meter. That's a definite job he gave me. I didn't know that for the longest time. And there's a story behind that that maybe someday I'll tell. But the point is, I enjoy doing it. Because when I look at that text, I see him. It, it just It's just his humor, his viewpoint, his thought pattern are completely and utterly 100% revealed. If I were dead and in heaven right now, I couldn't see him any more clearly than I see him in scripture right this second. That's why I do it. I'm not doing it to be a good girl. I'm not doing it to sell you either. I'm doing it because I need to. And I'm doing it because I enjoy it. Whether you get something out of it, well, only God can make that happen. I don't, I don't care if anybody watches my videos or reads my web pages or anything. I mean, I care about it in the extent that I don't want people wasting their time. But I know God's going to deploy it. But it's secondary to the reason I do it. I do it to learn him better. I do it to see him. And I enjoy this immensely. I wish this is all I ever did. I wish I didn't have to work and I could just study scripture. Okay. The point is, it's, it, it has a certain superficial similarity to an addiction in that I, I wouldn't want to live without it. But it's unlike an addiction in that, A, littler doses do bigger things versus a regular addiction that sin and good deeds produce where you have to do more in order to get a lower high. And it's unlike an addiction in another way, well, it's kind of like an addiction in that way too. When you're addicted to something, you'll go to greater and greater lengths more and more effort to get it. If you're, you know, the, the, the murderer is a good example, but it's the same thing with drugs and food and alcohol and pretty much everything else. The more you get addicted to something, the more trouble you'll go to to get it. I mean, I'm addicted to peanut butter. If I don't have peanut butter in my cupboard, and I have to go without it for more than like two, three days. It, 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 you know, it grains on me. I feel the same way about milk. There's certain foods that I just got to have a steady supply of. Liver. I mean, I'm sure you don't like my taste in food, but that's, you know, that's just me. But the point is, is that an addiction is something you, you don't want to live without or you can't live without. You think you can't live without, really. Bible is, I'm addicted to it in that sense. But, at the same time, obviously not addicted because I'm constantly going against the will of God. I'm sinning all the time. So, it's like an addiction and not like an addiction. It's got the good parts of what addiction does for you, but not the bad parts. Living without scripture doesn't make sense to me anymore. I do it, and I always regret it. Why? Because I could have spent that minute learning God better and I didn't. Notice how that's different from the good deeder. The good deeder is less and less discerning. I'm, when I realize I lived a minute without scripture, that's a discernment. It's internal. It's not based on anybody approving me. It's not even based on God approving me. It's not based on sin or good deed. It's like, here's something I could have had that I want and I didn't do it. And I sort of make a mental note, don't do it again. Of course, I'll do it again. Look at the difference between good deeds. With good deeds, the addiction becomes unthinking. Undiscerning. So if they tap you for a good deed, the first time, the second time, the hundredth time, the hundred and first time, they might be asking you to do something entirely stupid. That's an effort measure. You're, you're so addicted, you're willing to go to extra effort. Here, you're going against your common sense. And they ask you to go do a good deed that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. They're telling you it's a good deed. They're just slapping the name on it. It's not really a good deed. But because they've slapped it and you want that approval, you'll do it. 
no matter how stupid it is or wrong. Okay? With God, that never happens. With God, the discernment increases. With God, even when you're going against God, the discernment increases. And it's all internal. And it's not about... I'm not doing this to get God's approval. I can't get God's approval. Christ is my approval. I'm not righteous. He is. I got his righteousness. I can't have any of my own. That's a done deal. I'm not doing it for that reason. I'm doing it just because it's enjoyable. Because I want to know God. So all questions of good and bad... In the sense of self-approval, are completely that they're not even on the table. Okay, I mean, I still might phrase things in terms of good and bad, right, wrong, but that's only to to to, to find out what's the answer. I'm interested in the answer. Okay, it's a way to navigate to the answer, and there's a whole lot more discernment going on. So it stops entirely being God completely wiped it out anyway and I'm really well aware of this now. It stops being about the fact he's high, I'm low. He's good, I'm bad. Yeah, we all know that. Okay, how do you think, God? What what what's your view on this? On brand flakes? Cuz inquiring minds want to know. And it that ends up being the entire story. Okay? It's only when I have a divergence from his opinion or, I, or I'm too, still too attracted to some human viewpoint idea that there's a struggle. And then I start thinking in terms of good or bad person because my sin nature kicks in. Okay? So what's happening is I'm becoming less addicted to my sin nature and more addicted to the Bible and less addicted to approval and more addicted to just the intrinsic value of the thing. So, whenever I'm doing something between sins, how good do you think it is? Really good. Do I understand what kind of good it is? No. Sometimes I do. Usually I find out after the fact. Or I don't ever know. But I know the Holy Spirit did something to me during that time. And it pleases God. And that moment lives to Him forever. And Matthew 4, 4, always occurring is occurring. That's enough. I want dad pleased. And I am addicted to that. But all I have to do is be between sins and whatever God's doing. I don't even know, so I can't say that I did something good. Because I don't even know what it was. I just know it happened. So you notice what's not happening. There's no... Um, there, there is a lower addiction to self-approval. There is a higher addiction to just because. I know the Holy Spirit did something to me, that's enough. And then I ask questions like, what was it? So I can learn God better. But it's, it ends up just being about the relationship. It stops being about right, wrong, really. Those are navigational questions. They're not the end result. I'm willing to go to any price to go to the store of God and find out how He thinks. And and it's been, I've been caused to find out just how much. I'm really surprised. People have said that to me, but I didn't believe them. They told me I was totally committed to God, and I didn't think I'm committed at all not committed to him enough as far as I'm concerned but anyway the point is that it stops being about whether I'm a good person or believing in God or oh I'm a good Christian I don't even care and I don't have to I already got God's approval on the cross 2,000 years before I was born 